thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here. Uh, before I start, I have three confessions to make. So I'm going to start with the first one, which is that my understanding of IITs is, is that everybody comes to IIT, studies really hard. Half of them go abroad, the other half go to tech firms. Uh, and so I was actually wondering why an FMCG firm was here. Your couple of your colleagues have disabused me of that idea. So I hope I can shed some light on the FMCG industry for you today. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions, of course. The second is uh, this job that I have currently is only my second company. I've worked my entire career in FMCG. So I'm slightly biased. Uh, I think it's a fabulous industry and a great place to work. And I'm only slightly biased. Um, the third confession that I have to make is actually as you will hear, I have been quite privileged and quite lucky. And a lot of the things that have happened to get me here probably owe more to that than the great capability that was alluded to. But then what's anybody without uh, a little bit of luck? So those are my three confessions. I'm going to start actually by talking about the FMCG industry per se. Uh, every one of you must interact with all FMCG brands or a lot of FMCG brands on, on a daily basis. I'm not going to ask you, but I trust that every one of you has brushed your teeth with Colgate this morning and will do so at night. So that's the caveat uh, of the conversation. But the industry in India, about $170 billion last year, half of it sitting in what we call home and personal care, about 30% of it sitting in foods and beverages, and 20% of it sitting in healthcare. Um, and this industry, even at this size, about $170 billion, actually has tremendous potential to grow. If you do the maths, and all of you, I'm 100% sure, have better math capabilities than I do. But if you do the simple maths of 170 billion people divided by our population, you will see, as a $170 billion divided by our population, you will see how utterly tiny the consumption per capita is. And when you think about how much that consumption could be, this is an industry that should be four, five, six times its current size easily. And that's that too without adding uh, new categories. And this industry therefore actually grows quite rapidly or it has done at a CAGR, double digit CAGR, usually in the ballpark of 10 to 12% per annum between price and, uh, and volume, which makes it actually quite attractive. Then I know a lot of you are in the job market or will be in the job market. I have a 21 year old son who also finds himself in a similar position. Uh, three, about 3 million people is what the industry employs currently in India. However, that number again set to grow because of this opportunity of the size and the expansion. And when you think about you know, how much an Indian consumes and maybe I can give it to you in toothpaste terms, the average Indian consumption of toothpaste is half that of China, a third that of Philippines, and a sixth that of Brazil. So if you do the maths and multiply it, you will realize that there's just so much more opportunity in this industry and so much more opportunity for people to come along and actually do things differently. And sitting as I do uh, in a large company or two large companies, I think the, what's also really exciting is the work that's happening in all of the smaller brands. The startup brands that are, and I'm sure many of you know many of those brands, uh, the startup brands that are also coming into the FMCG space, uh, making it all together a significantly more exciting space. So that's a little bit uh, about the industry itself. Uh, really simple but fascinating industry. The industry runs on you serving your consumer, more so than any other industry. Like in the world of mobile phones, you can say, this is the tech that I want to do, and consumer, you come reach me. And consumers will want to come and reach you and want to learn, and they'll go through the, the struggle of learning. In FMCG, you have to almost go to the consumer to say, I understand the pain that you're going through, the needs that you have, and I'm able to create products at the right price and available next door because I'm certainly not going from here to New York to buy. I might go to buy an iPhone in the, in the Apple store. I'm certainly not going to buy uh, toothpaste uh, in New York. So uh, that is really the simplicity and the joy of the FMCG industry, which is that it's inherently about understanding every individual consumer 
but equally about bringing them into these groups and cohorts that allow you to then take action. Because while I would love to make a toothpaste for Kaviraj and one for you and one for you, that's not really possible. So we have to find what is the grouping and how can we do it. And, and I think that for me is what keeps me energized and entertained throughout this entire journey uh, that I've had. And speaking of journey, I'm going to spend maybe the next five, 10 minutes talking about my journey. Then I'd love some comments or questions because it just makes it so much easier than my just going on and on. Uh, so this is my 20, I graduated from IIM Bangalore. I'm almost beginning to lose track now in 1997. So this is my 26th or 27th year of working. I joined uh, Unilever from campus in what was a truly fabulous job uh, to the many women in this room. I joined as the brand manager of Lakme. So my very first job was to try on lipstick and nail polish and get paid for it. It was quite fun. Uh, from there, I went on to do some work in Consumer Insight, uh, moving back to Bangalore. Uh, then from there, I used handled brew. A lot of you drink brew, I hope. Still a favorite brand. Uh, so I handled brew, then went, came back into Consumer Insight, worked in tea for a little while in the whole uh, development, uh, brand development or innovation area of tea, and then I moved to Dubai. Uh, come back to that story because that was, I think, one of my crucible moments in life and a leadership principle or at least a, a life principle that I've not forgotten. Uh, I moved to Dubai and handled Africa, Middle East and Turkey uh, for the tea business at that time. And then you will notice that through this entire journey, I've not said the word sales at all. And when you think FMCG, I'm sure you think sales. Uh, and I had not done sales till then, but I then came back to India to do my very first sales job as a branch head which was an interesting uh, exercise in Delhi. And uh, I will not even attempt to speak Hindi, but if you hear my Hindi, you will also realize the dual challenge of neither knowing sales nor knowing great Hindi. Uh, I did that for a while, then moved to Chennai uh, to do the same job for, for a couple of years. I've lived here since. I lived down the road, about three kilometers down the road in Arepuram. Uh, and then went on to do a couple more jobs, one in skincare, uh, one in home care, and then over the last 18 months uh, in this job that I do currently uh, in Colgate Palmolive. I'm married, I have two kids. My son, like I told you, is 21, finishing his third year of, uh, of college. Uh, my daughter is 14, goes to school, also a couple of kilometers down the road from here uh, in Sisha, just going into 10th standard. And she'll be very amused that anybody wants to hear my point of view on careers because she doesn't want to hear it uh, at home. So it's nice that I can do this uh, at least uh, outside of home. So that's really been a little bit of my journey. Two or three things that I think uh, I found useful through this journey and I hope that uh, you will find useful. I think the first thing is you are exceedingly lucky. I genuinely think this is the best time to be in this country. Everything that good that is going to happen in this world over the next couple, two, three decades, which will be your most productive years, will definitely have a role in this country or will actually emanate from this country. So to sit where you are at and on the cusp of getting out into the world to start working, I would give anything to do it now than do it 25 years ago. I think you truly have advantage and I hope that all of you will leverage that advantage. I was really happy to hear that only 5% of the batch tends to go abroad to, uh, to study. Um, I think this, the second thing is as you start up, the, uh, the, one of the things that I think you will struggle with is the plethora of choice that you have. I, I know that when I graduated, the, firstly, your graduation itself had very limited choice. If you were really bright, doctor or engineer, if you weren't really bright, then science, commerce, and arts in that hierarchy, and, and that was it. Now there are just so many choices of what you can do, and what that, I think, puts a strain on is being clear on what your priorities are. And it's very easy to have one priority one day and another priority another day, but to make sure that what you're clear on is your priority, I think is really important and I'll give you an example. I'd worked in HUL for about 10 years in Bangalore. They decided to move the office to Mumbai. Uh, by that time I was married, my son was three, I think. Uh, and my husband didn't want to move. He had a business that was based in Bangalore. I quit. 
because at that moment I didn't see a way that I could continue to work with HUL, continue to have be married and have a family. And even though I really liked the organization and I didn't want to quit, the priority at that time was family. Uh, and I think looking back, at that time I thought, oh my God, you know, my world has come to an end and nobody's ever going to employ me and all of those good things. But uh, as I look back, I think it really made zero difference. The difference that it did make is to make sure that it was clear to my family that they were the priority over anything else that I did. As luck would have it, Unilever hired me back in Dubai six months later and my husband managed to move there as well. So it all worked out well. But I do think that at the time that the decision was taken, uh, the prioritization was really important. So that I think is for me one of the big life lessons or you know things to think about. What is your, and your priority has to be your priority. It can't be your parents' priority, it can't be your partner's priority, and later on in life it can't be your children's priority. It has to be yours and it, you have to make it work for you and you gotta take the consequences of that uh, prioritization that you do. So that's one piece of advice I would love to leave you with. I think the second piece of advice is as we get more and more tech obsessed, I find it impossible to have a dinner table conversation with my children unless I ban the phone. If the phone is on the table, the conversation is with the phone and not with the people around the table. But as we get more and more obsessed with tech, actually the need for human connection perversely becomes even more important. And one of the, the maxims that I have, and as all of you become leaders, I hope you will see is that it's a quote by Maya Angelou. It's like, people will forget what you told them. People will forget what you did for them, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think that for me is something that stays with me because it is quite easy to forget that. It's quite easy for me as a parent to be absorbed on my phone while my children are talking to me and, and vice versa. So as we get more tech obsessed, I think there is almost a need to become even more people obsessed. And the last one, which I don't think I need to say to students of IIT, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that uh, the rate of change is rapid. The only way you stay current is by staying curious. At no point in life can you feel, oh my God, I've learned everything, I know everything, I've reached the pinnacle of knowledge. A, because it's boring, you'll find yourself getting bored. And B, I think because it's not true. Uh, regardless of who you are, what you do, when you do it and how you do it, I think staying curious becomes a real Brahmastra in today's world because that is the way for you to make sure that the advantage that this absolutely wonderful institution is giving you with this the education that it's giving you and the badge value that it gives you that you're able to take that advantage and convert it into something tangible the only way you do that is by staying curious and staying on top of things so that's really a real top level view uh, I'd love to take any questions or comments or anything that either you agree or disagree with. Thank you. Uh, hi ma'am. So I wanted to ask, like you mentioned you have worked a lot of time in FMCG and uh, I'm assuming that it must have come in also uh, by working in places which are kind of remote because that is the kind of uh, notion that I have by talking to my friends who work in FMCG. So I want to know how did you survive your time in these those kind of remote places because that's not a metro button and that's not what we used to. And second thing is, how did you, I mean, how did your life change after you came from that place to Bangalore? So I think, uh, firstly, like I said, and I, I'm a, and I started off by saying that I have been quite privileged. The remotest place that I ever spent time in was Pondicherry. Uh, so truly remote, uh, very far away and, you know, off the map. But I think if I was to just paraphrase your question and say, for all the people that I've worked with who have done their sales stints in rural Bihar and, you know, South Tian and wherever else you want to call remote, I think they've actually had a truly wonderful time because of the human element of what happens. Because in those kind of geographies, the team bonding and the team spirit, because nobody actually belongs to that geography. Everybody is there to come and do a job. So the team is your family. Uh, I think makes a true difference as opposed to when you work in a Chennai or you work in a Mumbai, what happens is at the end of the day, everybody tends to go home because everybody has a home to go to. When you work in remote places, you have a real advantage of getting together with people and making relationships that are truly lifelong. So I think there isn't a 
you know, uh, everybody must aspire to stay in a metro all the time. Of course, there are pros and cons to doing these remote uh, locations. But uh, I think on in hindsight, if people let me do my career again, I would do sales at the beginning of my career because I think I missed out a lot on a lot of the bonding and the stories and just the joy of having a, a team like that. And moving to metros, I've lived, unfortunately or fortunately, most of my life in metros. So I can't really tell you the difference between the two. Hello, ma'am. Uh, I'm Arjit. Uh, as you talk about a startup that are there in FMCG, and we all know that there are uh, two, three major, major players and all. And when you talk about startup, uh, FMCG startup, it's mostly uh, the profit, according to my understanding, comes from the scalability. Because a given product, uh, when it is scaled for, like if they sold for 1,000 or 100,000 uh, 100, units, then only you will have a profit. So how difficult it will be because startup, first of all, the capital that it had. So how difficult it will be for a person who is starting a startup in FMCG to compete with the three, four players on the nature of the startup that we have because it's depend on the scalability. So I think that's a great question. I'm going to answer in two parts. Uh, I think till a few years ago, you're absolutely right. There were many barriers to entering the FMCG as a startup. One is capital. Second is distribution reach because if you're not available, like we discussed near me, I'm not going to travel to Dubai. And then the third is the, the softer skills of actually running uh, a startup. All three have actually disappeared now. Capital, easily, you have a great idea, easily available. Between VCs, PEs, there's actually money chasing great ideas. Distribution, again, you put it on Amazon, you're as available as Colgate is available. Your uh, Amazon reach is what, 99% or little over 99 and a half percent of every pin code in this country. Your distribution, your availability is not the challenge. And again, the softer skills, there are enough people who as they put money also want to help you with the skills. So overall, the barriers that were built as moats and competitive advantages for large companies are certainly getting less. Having said that, it's hard to make money because you're absolutely right that unit economics become much better as you get scale in a, in a given, given space. But that's why your idea then has to be spectacular. Like there's no point you're waking up tomorrow morning and saying I'm going to compete with Colgate and I'm going to launch another toothpaste. Please don't. Uh, but it's, there's no point unless you have an idea, you have something that is different from what the established companies are doing. Then there's an opportunity for you to get in there and make the money. But it's not going to be an overnight thing. And I, if you see a lot of the startup companies, they tend to make a bit margins that are single digit to negative. Whereas the established companies tend to make a bit margins that are, what, 15, 20% minimum. And the better ones tend to make even more uh, than that. Hello, ma'am. Hi. Um, um, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, it's like considering the fact that you are a part of FMCG industry for uh, from beginning of your career, I want to ask you this question. Uh, what all? Wh what is the impact of new technologies like AI and ML on it's like on the industry on the current FMCG industry? How is it evolving? It's like absorbing these skills. So I think uh, uh, I'm going to answer that question in three parts. One from a consumer lens the ability to know and understand individual consumers, be able to cohort them, then to be able to use AI and ML to reach them with specific messages, so much better. When I first started working, there were one and a half channels. Your job was to create one piece of advertising, put it on that one and a half channels, and your job was done, right? Because it reaches everybody, everybody watches television. Now, if I was to ask this room, other than IPL, how many of you have watched television in the last one week? Exactly. And thank you for raising your hand. Otherwise, I thought, my God, television had fully died. But uh, that's exactly the point, right? If when I started working, that was utterly unheard of. So that change of where all of you are, therefore, all of you are watching different things. And all of you are on your phones. And my ability to reach you really does depend on how good we are at using that technology. And how good that technology is at crafting a message 
that it can read from your signals and respond to you. So that's one part. The second part is from a business lens in terms of what we do with forecasting, business planning, uh, what if scenarios of what's going to happen. All of that, again, depends on this kind of learning of what is our past data, what have we done, what are the various inputs, what's the model that we can create, how good is our algorithm to predict what will happen uh, when things happen. And then, of course, in supply chain, just driving efficiency. AI and ML make such a difference to just driving efficiency. All of our factories, for example, now have digital twins. It allows us to try so many things that we could never try on an actual shop floor. We can now try on the digital twin to say, if we were to do X, what would happen to our process? What would happen to the output? What would happen to speed? What would happen to material usage? So on and so forth. So many things that this kind of thing makes a dramatic difference. So while FMCG will never be at the cutting edge of you know, AI ML, it's not never going to be the industry that's going to be leading the creation of it, the adoption of AI ML makes a huge difference to, to the industry. And within the industry can be a real source of competitive advantage. Oh, you are just telling that it actually makes impact and I have a follow up question for this. Please. Uh, let's say if someone is willing to start a career in tech related stuff to FMCG, what all you will tell that it's like they, them understanding will make a lot of sense. So I think uh, a lot of eventually what we do is to make really good quality toothpaste and put it in consumers' hands. So the ability to understand the base process, and maybe I can give you a parallel. I don't know how many of you have seen Picasso's paintings. If you have seen them, you would have thought I can paint like that, and you probably could. But when you see where he started from, he actually started from learning to draw anatomy as anatomy is. And his early drawings were spectacularly good. Having learned that, he then said, okay, let me add, you know, my own take on how it is to be done and therefore that's my style. That would be my advice to you, that the shortcut cannot be, I understand AI ML, I don't understand the original process. It has to be, I understand the original process and therefore I can apply AI ML on top of it to say how it can be better. So my advice on anything, whether it is reaching consumers, whether it is, you know, forecasting and modeling of, uh, of business, whether it is supply chain, would be to understand the base of how it works and then say how do I apply tech rather than saying I have a tech solution without understanding the base. Does that answer your question? Uh, hello, oh, good evening ma'am. Uh, my question is that you uh, mentioned that FMCG is very consumer centric uh, industry and you have been to multiple uh, countries. So ma'am, how Indian customers are different from uh, the customers outside India? Can you share some example or story? So I think uh, firstly, at a core level, most people are the same. Please sit. Uh, at you. a core level, most people are the same. Things that matter here matter everywhere. Like for example, as a mom, the first thing that matters to me is my kids. My husband is somewhere. Kids, housekeeper, then husband, but that's an aside. But I, that is true of some of these base human values are actually the same. But one of the, th the two things that stand out for me about Indian consumers, one is their understanding of value. Value, not price. It's not that Indian consumers want to only buy the cheapest thing, but they want to make sure that what they are paying for delivers value. And so, you know, this entire thing of benefit by cost becomes really, really important. And the inherent sense that every Indian consumer has, however educated he or she is, is fantastic. Uh, and their ability to extract value. I don't know if you guys grew up in homes, but I certainly grew up in a home where even when you cut the milk packet, at the end you add little water, you shake it, and that last 5 ml of milk has to go in there. It doesn't matter how much money you have. But that value has to be extracted. And I think that I see only largely in this country. The second thing I think that I see a lot of in this country is that there is a... a less badge value, but a lot of social context. So I won't buy a brand because I'm allowed to say that, you know, okay, I drive a Ferrari, maybe I'd buy a Ferrari, but uh, it's not only for the badge value, but if the people that I know and I trust 
trust that brand. I think that word of mouth and the push that that gives this consumer uh, is actually quite high. And particularly in a context where information flow was lower than it is today. Now my friend has been substituted by apps and reviews and those kind of things, but uh, that tends to be quite high. But otherwise at a basic level, I think human beings are largely the same. Thank you. Ma'am, so I have, first of all, I would like to really appreciate how easily you articulate such difficult topics from management. That is really nice. Thank you. Secondly, I'm an MBA student here at IT Madras. So being a technology oriented MBA student, how would I contribute to an organization like Colgate, which is totally into probably more into supply chain and marketing oriented roles? You know, the, the bottom line of everything, and it goes back maybe to this value thing, is what consumers eventually buy is the product. Uh, in my just previous job, I used to work on home care, and the amount of tech that goes into a laundry product, which talks about, you know, whether it's a protease-based stain, amease-based stain, whether it is blood, chocolate, you know, depending, oil, each of those actually needs a different enzyme to lift. Uh, and marrying of all of those enzymes coupled with the quality of water that is there in that particular vicinity gives the output that the consumer wants. And because she is so closely involved with it, she can tell you whether something is good, bad or ugly. And that tech to be able to, that is the cornerstone of good FMCG. Eventually, the product must deliver. If the product doesn't deliver, you can survive for a little while and you'll be okay. But eventually, you know, the truth will tell. And so this idea of product tech, really important, firstly. Secondly, I think as business processes get more and more complex, uh, there is a tech involved in business processes get more complex. The whole, you know, VUCA thing, volatile, uncertain, blah, blah, etc. continues to play out. Ability to understand the what if scenarios, what could happen, what, what are the risks that your business faces, how could those risks be mitigated against, again, I think becomes the second part. And then the third part becomes consumers are fragmenting, they're harder to reach, how do we make sure that we are not frittering away our money and advertising, like you said, is the lifeblood of an FMCG company and a hundred years ago or so, somebody said that I know, my, I know half my advertising works, I don't know which half. That continues to be true even today. So the more that that which half can become which 20% or which 10%, that's a staggering advantage. And again, their tech can play a role. So as a combination of these, depending on what kind of tech you do, uh, there's always opportunity for you to come and contribute in this kind of industry. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, you have been working in the FMCG industry for more than 20 years. So uh, you have worked in various types of products. So how does in a ma marketing perspective, how like uh, working for a toothpaste and for another product, how does the perceiving of the customer, like how much, how do you perceive the customer experience in a marketing perspective and how has it evolved uh, during the 20 years? So I'll take, uh, thank you to all of you for reminding me how long I've worked. It really makes me feel very young and I fully appreciate it. Uh, but jokes apart, I think uh, the difference between the categories firstly is on how much of the category delivery is real and measurable and how much of the category delivery is a little bit about perception. So for example, uh, I don't know if you use a face wash. Fantastic. You don't actually know if your face wash is delivering what it is supposed to deliver. It promises you whitening, charcoal to remove pollution. Uh, it, there are many, many benefits that it promises you. But it's impossible for you to tell whether it's actually delivering or it's not delivering. Laundry, as an alternate example, you have, you know, you play football, you get mud stain on your shirt. You can tell. Is the mud stain there or the mud stain is gone? Courtesy the laundry, you can tell. So the first difference in categories is how much of the category delivery is perception and how much of the category delivery is real. And that makes a big difference to where, how, and how much focus you put. So if you therefore see a lot of the skincare brands, a lot of the focus is actually on creating that perception, creating a brand image. You know, you'll have the 
John Abrahams and the Var Varun Dhawans and all of them telling you that they use that face wash. So that becomes really important. So that I think is one fundamental difference between how uh, the categories run. And knowing that is important. The second is pricing in this country, really critical. There are some categories that are very close to commodity in terms of pricing. So your soap, your laundry powder, if you have noticed, or if you haven't noticed, you can notice now, as crude oil goes up and down, your soap and your laundry pricing will go up and down. Because crude is the biggest input cost into, or derivatives of crude are the biggest input uh, into these products. And then there are categories like toothpaste, like shampoo, like uh, skin care, where there isn't that much of a linkage. So they're not that close to commodity and pricing cycles, therefore, don't run with commodity cycles. So that's the second difference. You had a second part to your question. So how has it evolved? I think there are two or three things that have changed. One, the amount of information available with consumers has gone up hugely. So today I launch a product, tomorrow there will be a hundred reviews telling the consumer whether that product is worth trying or not worth trying. In the past I would have had to wait for, you know, friends, family, neighbors, everybody to try it and maybe that would have taken a very, very long time. So really there is nowhere for manufacturers to now hide on products that don't work because very quickly that will be out in the open. I think the second thing is consumers' willingness to experiment at the top of the pyramid, it hasn't changed at the middle or the bottom of the pyramid, has become much higher. I'm sure many of you, your FMCG products aren't exactly the same, but when you grew up at home, you probably remember that the products roughly stayed the same. Your toothpaste would have stayed the same, the soap that you used in your house would have been the same, the shampoo, the hair oil, they would have been one brand that nine out of ten times would have been in your home. And when you consider your own behavior, you would have realized that the information that's available to you is making you make a lot more change and a lot faster, a lot more experimentation. Uh, those are probably the biggest changes, all of which have implications for company. The more you experiment, the more I need to be top of mind every time you want to make a change. The more, you know, reviews and ratings matter, the more I need to make sure that my products deliver and reviews and ratings are good enough to convince you to buy. So all of these have implications for uh, companies and manufacturers. Oh, hello, ma'am. Uh, I have a little uh, short question in continuation, uh, continuation with what he was talking about, the startup ecosystem in India. Uh, we know that... Uh, a brand like Colgate has a very uh, strong edge when it comes to supply chain and marketing. Uh, and you also spoke about startups having very low EBITDA margins. But we also know that startup ecosystem is growing very fast right now in India. So how much is it really affecting Colgate? Like, uh, is Colgate really worried about these startups popping up or is it not that significant? I think the answer is probably, I don't know, I wouldn't classify it as worry. Uh, I would classify it as that it's interesting that people are wanting to enter your category and they obviously enter with a point of difference, otherwise they die. So, there's, so then you're looking at it thinking that when somebody looks at a category afresh, what are they seeing? Because we've been in this country for 87 years, we've looked at oral care in a certain way for 87 years. As you get new entrants coming in, they look at the category differently. And they talk about different vectors that maybe we hadn't talked about earlier. I think what it does, it just makes you fitter to compete. And the good companies will survive. Uh, the ones that don't compete well, maybe one day will find themselves that they don't survive. But that then becomes the challenge to say, you must be the, the good company that doesn't make an 87-year-old company go bust. Hey, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Sorry, good evening, ma'am. Uh, so I have a brief, I'll tell you a brief story. And after that, maybe I'll ask a follow-up question regarding that. So I still remember my mom saying that when I had to buy toothpaste, so she said go and buy Colgate instead of saying toothpaste. So follow-up question is how do you create such a monopolistic great brand? Uh, I think Colgate has something about more than 75% market set in India in terms of toothpaste. So I think... Um Firstly, the word, I'm not allowed to use the word monopolistic, so I'm going to go around that, uh, that word. But I think the, one of the things is that FMCG actually is a really simple business. Really simple business. Good quality product at the right price, in the right place that you know about. That's it. 
if you can get these four things right, you've sorted the whole of your FMCG business out. And I think companies that have the advantage of being the first player, as Colgate was in this country, in toothpaste, and then you sustain this right product, right price, right place, right advertising, you tend to sustain an advantage. Having said that, to the other question that we've been discussing, there's always old and new players who want to then who look at you and go, oh wow, great, you have this much share, let me try and nibble at that share, let me take a piece of that pie. And then making sure that you're always ahead of the curve to stay ahead of that is also important. But then we're just lucky that these legacy brands have been built at a time when there was an opportunity to build such brands. I don't think there will be brands, and this is me sticking my neck out, but I don't think there will be a brand born in the last 10 years that will become a you know, 50, 60, 70 share brand in 50 years. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, yeah, just a second. Hi, ma'am. I'm Pratham Khandewal. So I have two questions. So first question is that, uh, is it true that the FSNG market, like initially it was very price sensitive in India, especially the FMCG things, till a particular tolerance. But now with the Gen Z's and all, the uh, what is the price sensitivity is reducing because the people are more oriented towards buying a brand or a class of a uh, product rather than going towards the price sensitivity. This is my first question. And the second question is that is the experiment appetite decreases as the people grow? Let's say uh, a 20 year person will be more uh, experimenting with different products, different brands rather than a 40 years or 50 years of a person. Is it true? Yeah. So I think, uh, uh, you know, you can say anything about India and it'll be true. And you can say the absolute opposite, it will also be true. So price sensitivity, I think is one of those subjects. There is always a set of consumers who are price sensitive. And actually they're not price sensitive, they're value sensitive. So when you move up the price without giving delta value, the ratio is going off and therefore they're saying, I don't want to buy you. Equally at the top of the pyramid, there are, I think what, between 40 to 60 million people in this country who have more than enough money for FMCG. So FMCG experimentation for them is not a big deal. I can buy a product, I don't like it, I will throw that product or I'll give away that product to someone else and I will buy something else. That joy or that appetite is only available with a still a small set of consumers in India and even then they have to fight against years of conditioning of you don't waste and you will eat and you will not leave anything on your plate and all of these good things that all of us have grown up with it doesn't matter how much money you have you still have to fight against that so price sensitivity I would just classify it as saying we're a value sensitive market and I don't see that changing but the ability to convince people that who have money to pay more for greater value is obviously much easier than to convince people who unfortunately have uh, have less money. Repeat your second part of your question again. So the second part is that does the experimentation appetite of a person decreases with the age? For example, let's say a 20 year person will be more likely to experiment different product, different brands than, rather than a 50 year person who has been using some brand for let's say 30 years or something. Actually, you know, it's funny in an FMCG context now, I don't think there is anybody here regardless of their age and I'm not going to look at anybody who's closer to my age while I give you this answer. But uh, I don't think there's anybody who uses one or two brands. Mostly people have a set of brands that they've gotten used to over a period of time and between that set of brands, they're willing to rotate. Uh, and move around from A to B. When people are younger and getting into categories for the first time or particularly when they get married, that tends to be a tipping point for new choices. I want to change what was used in my mom's house and I want to use what I'm using in my house. At those moments, new consideration sets are created and then they tend to operate within that consideration set till either something in that consideration set disappoints them dramatically or there's some external influence of a new brand that comes along and tells you, I'm so much better than what you have in your consideration set and therefore it comes in. So I don't know whether that's experimentation declining or that's just a, a better understanding of, you know, what I like and what I don't like. So I, I don't have an empirical answer to that one. I mean, I know that now you manage not just sales, marketing, distribution, HR processes, R&D, all of that, right? So as a, C, as a managing director, how do you actually uh, spend your time, which gets maximum priority? 
don't tell my team, but I do the least work of anybody in my entire company, but please don't tell them. Uh, I think the joy of the job that I have is that because the full width of everything is available to me, I get to go into depth of the things that truly interest me. So what's new for me in this job versus my earlier job is we are a listed company. We have an external board to manage. That is brand new. So spending time on understanding how that works, what's happening to the stock price. Uh, I hope you guys have, by the way, invested in Colgate shares. They're only up by 80% over the last one year. Uh, that kind of thing really interests me. And so I spend more time in it. Uh, aside from that, it is more, the job is more about setting direction, setting strategy, and then making sure that when people need help to get to that direction and strategy, you're there to provide that help. Whether that help is the removing of obstacles or that help is by asking a couple of questions or if you have the experience providing a couple of answers. That's perhaps the, the core of the job. Uh, and it's actually not that hard. I think it gets easier the more senior you get. I know I 100% worked harder when I started working. Since my CMO is not here, I'm going to say no, but uh, I'm sure his view might be slightly different, but I am going to say no. Actually, I think it's also because I've done that for quite a while. So the new is always more interesting than what you've done already. Hello, ma'am. Uh, uh, ma'am, one question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is nothing to do with technology or business. It's more to do with you. I'm really interested to know what are those some of those actions activities that you you would attribute which helped you break the glass ceiling and move up to the MD level? Um, I think, phew, tough question. Firstly, I think I was really lucky to have some fabulous mentors and sponsors. And as women, we tend not to reach out to people who can help us. We tend to be a little bit reticent and I'm, you know, a fully and utterly stereotyping. I know that. But uh, I think there is a, a there is more reticence with women to seek out people who could help you and who could clear your path. I was very lucky to have throughout my career people who looked out for me. And, you know, the example of having never done sales and been given a sales job was because somebody in the organization felt I could do the sales job. My comment when they said come and do sales in Delhi was to laugh saying have you heard my Hindi and I don't know the S of sales. So and then it was convincing me saying I trust you can do the job so why would you not trust that you can do the job. So I think finding people like that is perhaps one of the most important things. Uh, the second, and I didn't do this very well, but I would urge everybody in this room, man or woman, to, to do this, is to seek out challenging assignments. Put your hand up for the stuff that makes you uncomfortable. That's in that moment is when you get noticed. In that moment is when good things happen to you because mostly most of us have a lot of capability. Barring the people who work in ISRO, uh, we don't do anything remotely close to rocket science. So it's really actually simple. So when there are tough assignments, put up your hand and say, me, I want to do this. Give me a shot at it. I think that will really help because that then sets you up for saying, oh, she can do this then she can do that as well. That would probably be my second piece of advice. And the third one, please don't tell my husband. I hope he's not going to hear it, is that 100% you need support at home. Whether that support comes from your parents, it comes from your kids, it comes from your husband, it comes from, uh, you know, some other partner, that is critical. There is no way I would be standing here if, uh, if I didn't have that support. Because even today and for the last eight years, I have spent Monday to Thursday in Mumbai and Fridays and Friday, Saturday, Sunday here in Chennai. So my kids for the last eight years have pretty much relied on their dad to do whatever it is that they do. And that's, you know, a trade-off that I've chosen to make and that's a trade-off that my husband has actually lived with, without which this would be, you know, truly impossible. Hello, ma'am. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey. It was, uh, as an MBA student, it's truly inspiring. Um, I hope we are not making you tired with asking so many questions. We are all so curious about you. Um, one thing you briefly told about taking a, a sales role in the start uh, over marketing, but as an MBA student, we all have a slight negative notion over sales. We think that it is less creative and the application of our knowledge is little lesser there. I wanted to hear more about your experience where you had many uh, uh, experiences where you could apply more over sales than marketing? So I think, uh, you know, there are two or three things that sales does that marketing cannot do. 
the first thing I think is that it gives you very early in life a leadership job, very early. Because you're out there and usually you're leading a team of 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever number you want to put. People whose collective experience would be 10 times your age. Forget your experience. Uh, and that, the learning that you get from doing a leadership job like that, there is no substitute. You know, I can tell you 40 books to read. You've probably read 40 of your own. Uh, but actually doing it, there is absolutely no substitute. And I don't think there is a better job than sales for you to learn that. And what those leadership lessons, I think, teach you is an awful lot about yourself. It teaches you... When am I at my best? It teaches you what happens when I'm under pressure. It teaches you how do I deal with somebody who's fully aligned to what I'm saying to fully not aligned to what I'm saying. So it teaches you so many things that you're never going to learn otherwise. I think the second thing is that it's a little bit of a misnomer that sales is not creative. Yes, there is a rhythm and a rigor to sales execution where, you know, everyday great execution makes the best salespeople. But your job as leader of that team for your little microcosm, let's say you're running Chennai Metro, is to say, what is happening to this city? Chennai Metro is expanding in this, this direction. Am I set up for making sure that I have a service capability in that direction? It's rapidly becoming a self-service store environment. Gone are the, you know, I will stand behind the counter and ask for product. What what is my model for self-service service, if you know what I mean, uh, as opposed to the grocery store service. Equally, uh, distributors in these kind of geographies, it's hard to make money. It's expensive to operate in a metro. So are my distributors making money? What does you know a distributor of the future look like in a geography like this? So there's an immense amount that you can do to actually fundamentally change business. And what is lovely about sales is you can think it today, implement it tomorrow, and see a result day after. And that joy, uh, I think, is unparalleled. In marketing, and I love marketing, by the way, don't get me wrong, I'm just saying that in marketing, you make a piece of advertising, you put that advertising out there, you wait three months to hear whether it's moved, whether sales has moved, whether you've done the right thing, you've not done the right thing. So I think there are pros and cons to both, but I would greatly urge all of you, if you get the opportunity to do sales, to surely to do it. To introduce a new product in a rotation market, like for example, Colgate Ved Shakti, right? So what kind of steps do you follow? So I think regardless of the new product, you got to first start with the consumer saying, what is the pain or the joy, the pain that I'm solving for or the joy that I'm going to create? That's always the first step. Then the second step is to say, what is this benefit worth to the consumer in the context of what it costs me to make, in the context of the benefit that you're providing, and in the context of what are the substitutes that are available. So in the context of those three, how am I going to price that product? And then the question is, which set of consumers and where do they shop and how do I make it available? So depending on who I'm talking to, am I, do I have to be available in deep rural or do I have to be available in, you know, only in e-commerce or what combination of those uh, across the spectrum? And lastly, how is he or she going to get to know about it? What am I going to say? What is going to be that one, you know, I get what on average advertising, maybe I should ask you guys if you remember any advertising, but on average, it's quite hard to get attention through advertising. So I can say one thing and I need to say it quite sharply. What is going to be that one thing that's going to make her want to move the inertia of what she does already to doing something new. It's not like, you know, in most of our categories, it's system one that's doing the thinking. It's not system two. I'm not waking up every morning and thinking, should I put toothpaste on my toothbrush? How much should I put? What angle should I put it? I'm doing it by rote. And I buy toothpaste also by rote, right? I go to a shelf, I pick it up and I put it. So how do I break into that system one thinking when I'm doing something new becomes really important. So then you got to be pretty sharp. I think that's the best use of time that we can have. And thank you a lot, ma'am, for giving us insight. Uh, for me, I think uh, the amount of business insight that I got has already been more than what I can do in the one month of YouTube video. And uh, meanwhile, we know that you are residing in Chennai. So maybe we would love to host you in future as well for our audience. And can we have a very big round of applause for ma'am? Uh, Thank you and good luck to all of you. Uh, I will also request Mr. Kaviraj sir to felicitate our eminent speaker.
Thank you so much for that wonderful session. I think uh, a lot of insights and uh, mentioned in a very humorous and very entertaining, uh, riveting conversation actually. I think our students definitely, we hope more and more of our students actually get inspired and come to consume, you know, FMCG sector too and not just to the usual technology companies. We really, we really value your time and your uh, commitment to, thank you. Yeah.